This video is made for the purposes of entertainment and education, and is not intended as an attack on any party featured. In 1948, apartheid was established in South Africa, a system which ensured a culture of racial segregation and white leadership in the country's political and economic infrastructure. While the apartheid ended in the early 90s, the social ramifications of segregation are felt in the country even to this day through social inequality. Naturally, during apartheid, black South Africans fought for their rights. Prominent anti-apartheid activists such as Nelson Mandela and Steve Biko were arrested for their activism. In 1977, Biko was beaten to death by security officers while in detention, whereas Nelson Mandela was incarcerated for 27 years after being given a life sentence for sabotaging the apartheid regime and conspiring to overthrow the state. He spent time in prison from 1964 to 1990. In the late 1980s to early 90s, the National Party entered negotiations with the African National Congress, leading to the highly publicized release of ANC figures from prison, the end of apartheid legislation, and eventual multiracial elections. Nelson Mandela went on to become the first black president of South Africa between the years 1994 and 1999. And this was a big deal, not only for South Africa, but the world as a whole. Mandela was an African nationalist and a socialist and even served in the banned South African Communist Party. For as radical as his politics were, he managed to gain international acclaim and eventually gained political power and influence. Ordinary South Africans are determined that the past be known, the better to ensure that it is not repeated. They seek this not out of vengeance, but so that we can move into the future together. Mandela would live on until 2013. And yet, supposedly, people remember it differently. <laughs> this is Jane with Style of Substance. Today I'll be talking about the Mandela Effect. The term Mandela Effect was coined by paranormal researcher Fiona Broom to describe the phenomenon in which a significant number of people reported having vivid memories of Nelson Mandela dying in prison sometime in the 1980s, despite the fact that history shows something completely different. Supposedly, all of Mandela's post-incarceration political accomplishments never happened, or at the very least, people don't remember them happening. Inconveniently, though unsurprisingly, next to nobody who actually lives in South Africa or anyone who pays close attention to South African politics and history remembers or misremembers Mandela dying in prison. Yet, according to Broom, many report having this potentially false memory, contrary to history, and interestingly can recall specific details that are more or less shared with other people. The fact that so many remember events unfolding in the same or similar manner that apparently never occurred makes this phenomenon an interesting case study in social psychology. But Broom introduces a hypothesis that the Mandela Effect could be evidence of multiple universes or timelines that converge together. Yes, you heard me right. Alternate realities and universes. It's a possibility that a rift in our time space would open up and you would be able to see into a different time space. Which is why some people remember the old timeline and some people have the memory of the new timeline. And one of the theories for this happening is that some people think that we have actually switched into a different parallel universe. For as fun as speculating about the supernatural and the unknown may be, the correct answer is often the most logical one. The human brain and the memories it produces are untrustworthy, subject to manipulation by memetics and association with similar images, 
rather than pointing towards something scientifically unlikely or supernatural. The memories people have of Nelson Mandela dying in prison are likely informed by a telephone game of misinformation, memories of him growing sick in prison, and the confabulation between Mandela and Biko, in addition to, simply put, complete ignorance. But perhaps they just don't want to admit that they got two black guys confused. Another well-documented, collectively shared false memory was reported in a 2010 study concerning people's memory of the clock at the Bologna Central Railway Station which was damaged during the Bologna Massacre bombing in 1980. 92% of the respondents remembered the clock was damaged during the explosion, and the time remained still at 10.25 ever since. History shows that in actuality, while the clock was damaged during the attack, it was repaired soon after, but then set to 10.25 years after the fact in 1996, in memory of those who lost their lives during the terrorist attack. The conclusion of the study was not evidence of something unlikely or supernatural, but simply put, Individual memory distortions shared by a large group of people develop into collective false memories. It's important to note that many of the respondents had a personal familiarity and emotional connection to the event, and saw the idea of the stopping clock to hold symbolic value. And so this distorted memory stuck with them, for it is easier to believe in a sense that time stopped, at the moment of the explosion, and believe that the clock had always remained at 1025, then it is that train station employees tinkered with it every so often. An emotionally loaded symbol acts as a post-event misleading information and obscures the real experience, leading to widespread individual forgetting, which results in a collective memory distortion. In sum, both individual failures in remembering and collective attempts to produce stable symbols can be considered the likely basis for the development of pervasive and consistent false memories. If we were to treat the Mandela effect for what, in all likelihood, it is, a social psychological phenomenon, then the supposedly false collective consensus surrounding the Bologna clock is a prime example of the Mandela effect. However, the niche community surrounding the Mandela effect point to cases like these to be paranormal, in part out of interest in discovering the unknown, reaching enlightenment, and or validating the legitimacy of their memory. Okay, but if you had to pick an explanation... False memory. Look, on Reddit... <laughs> Legit source. It's just a jumping off point. Fair enough. Look, I keep coming back to either we're sliding between parallel realities or, or B, like a simulation. Like we're, we're living in some holodeck VR shit and it's glitching out. Or it's just false memory. Throughout the 2010s, the Mandela effect quickly evolved in its application to include just about any and every widely shared memory of an event, person, place, or thing that is incongruous to the current reality we reside in. Popular examples of the Mandela Effect, or reality shifts as the community calls them, include widespread false memories surrounding the spelling and design details of various brand logos and media titles, including the children's book series The Bernstein Bears, with an A but often believed to be the band Steen Bears, with an E. The second half of the cartoon series title Looney Tunes, mistaken to be tunes, as in cartoons, rather than tunes, as in musical tunes. Likewise, the serial Fruit Loops is mistaken to have the fruit spelled correctly, instead of with two O's. The candy bar Kit Kat is mistaken to have a hyphen in its name. The mascot for the board game Monopoly is mistaken to don a monocle. Jif Peanut Butter is mistaken to be Jiffy Peanut Butter, and the clothing brand Fruit of the Loom is mistaken to have a cornucopia housing the fruit in its logo. Many instances of the Mandela Effect follow similar patterns, as the aforementioned examples. Widely spread misquotes from films and music are also attributed to the Mandela Effect, such as people believing Hannibal Lecter says, Hello, Clarice, in The Silence of the Lambs, Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father, in The Empire Strikes Back. A mysterious voice says, if you build it, they will come, in Field of Dreams. And Brody says, we're gonna need a bigger boat, in Jaws. When in actuality, the quotes are as follows. Good morning. Good morning. 
Dr. Lecter, my name is Clarice Starling. No, I am your father. No, I am your father. If you build it, he will come. If you build it, he will come. And you're gonna need a bigger boat, respectively. You're gonna need a bigger boat. When it comes to music, the Mandela effect is also attributed. For example, the Rolling Stones song, Paint It Black, people remember the line being, I see a red door and I want to paint it black. When in actuality, what was originally written and sung was, I see a red door and I want it painted black. Many people have also performed it as, I want to paint it black including members of the Rolling Stones themselves. Many other examples of misremembered song lyrics follow the pattern of the original release being incongruous with people's memories and later performances and covers. I see a red door and I want to paint it black. People also believe that the passenger side mirrors of cars in the United States and other countries include the engraving Objects in mirror may be closer than they appear, when in actuality it reads as are closer, rather than may be closer. Furthermore, people remember seeing advertisements and even watching the 1990s children's film Shazam that stars Sinbad as a genie. In or around the same time, Shaquille O'Neal played a genie in Kazam, though it apparently never existed. But perhaps they just don't want to admit that they got two black guys confused. A bit less common, but still notable, reports of the Mandela Effect include incongruities between the world map and people's memories, including the location and size of New Zealand, and what was supposedly once landmass in the North Pole. Funny how Kiwis and people who actually study these things do not tend to have false memories surrounding them, but I digress. There is not a small chance that even you, my dear viewer, have been affected by this phenomenon in one way or another, perhaps by even some of the popular examples I provided, and to varying degrees of confusion and or aggravation. The sad reality is, our memory betrays us. I only request of you to accept the fact that you can be wrong. WRONG! Unfortunately, certain members of the Mandela Effect community refuse to accept the frequency that they are wrong. Indeed, they may acknowledge that they can mistake one thing for another, forget something, or remember something the wrong way, but these Mandela Effect truthers, as I call them, have a general tendency to refuse to acknowledge areas where they may be wrong, because it's safer and more comforting to assume that they are right. People are grasping at straws rather than accepting reality for what it is. Maybe it's you that can't accept that maybe none of this is real. Now, the Mandela Effect community consists of both skeptics who take interest in the phenomenon but generally acknowledge it is collective false memory, as well as the aforementioned Mandela Effect truthers who pledge allegiance to their memory and experiences and hyperfixate on apparently changed symbology, sometimes to a religious level, without a proper grasp on how their subjective biases may cloud their judgment. They're incapable of observing or acknowledging the obvious, insistent we should leave it alone, disregard what we've heard for ages with our own two ears, and shut down all further discussions on the matter. This startling behavior has been the phenomenon within the phenomenon when it comes to making people aware of reality shifts. Be prepared for it if you're newly awakening to all this. They deny the notion that certain memories could be false, so they endorse speculative theories instead. In simple terms, right as you die, your mind and consciousness transfers to an alternate reality where it gets to keep living. Within that alternate reality, there are bound to be slight changes. I refer to this group of people as Mandela Effect Truthers because they exhibit similar behavioral patterns to conspiracy theorists like 9-11 Truthers. The Mandela Effect cannot by most metrics be considered a conspiracy theory, however, because theories surrounding this phenomenon do not tend to involve belief in an actual conspiracy at play. Though many Truthers are also conspiracy theorists and may tie conspiracies to the Mandela Effect such as believing the government or CERN has a clearer picture of what is occurring. 
Rather, it is potentially a supernatural or cosmic phenomenon in which realities converge together and or our consciousness drifts between realities or takes notes of glitches in a simulation. Think the Matrix. The religious Mandela effect truth theories vary in their views, sometimes seeing this as a message from God himself or a demonic influence distorting God's reality. Neither are particularly founded by the Holy Bible, though. God's hand used to be reaching towards Adam's from up above, but it looks different now. God is still reaching out towards Adam, but God's hand is now on the same level as Adam's. He is no longer in a higher position. This means that God's importance or authority is being diminished. There is a general lack of consensus among Mandela Effect truthers as to what precisely is occurring, as well as how and why, with their answers varying across the board. What the truthers are generally unified by is a shared assumption that, one, their memories more or less accurately reflect a reality that they once occupied, and two, reality itself is shifting or has shifted, and or the individual is shifting or has shifted between realities. I, you know, it seems like people are shifting it at, like, you know, different times. Um, it's an incredible thing, but I think some people see my video... And maybe they shift right then. Of course, there will be many people more or less unaffected by the Mandela effect when an example arises. A person may always correctly remember the fact that Mandela lived on after his incarceration. Truthers will explain that this person is either native to the current reality or simply brainwashed by the changes. Even truthers acknowledge that not everyone is affected in the same way about the same things at the same time. For instance, one could be a Mandela Effect truther without even necessarily remembering Mandela died in prison. Although, when the truther becomes so invested in their community, they are easily swayed into believing examples of the Mandela Effect that they weren't even affected by. Or in other words, they start entertaining or adopting other people's supposedly false memories. If someone went up to you and they showed you the cover of the Berenstain Bears and they said, when I was a kid, I remember that being spelled differently. You weren't thinking about this. You weren't really paying much attention to this. You didn't really look at how it was spelled. So now you say, was it? I kind of remember that too. Even though you don't. Furthermore, because they no longer trust the stability of reality due to their understanding of the Mandela effect, truthers are more likely to fall into the trappings of conspiratorial thinking and embracing fringe theories, including the belief in a flat earth. To many active truthers, the Mandela Effect is a spiritual and existential sign that we must pay attention to. It's just an incredible thing, and I knew when this started to happen to me, I said, this is incredible. This is going to blow up. It's like one of the biggest things in human history. I mean, you got world wars, and you got this and that, but reality shifting where you have all these people noticing it at once. I asked my wife, I said, how do you spell those pizza rolls we used to buy the kids? And she says, T-O-S, T-I-N-O-S. I said, yeah, right? And I was, and I was finally, I was thinking, oh, we might be onto something here. She finally notices something. And so I said, no, they've always been Totinos. And then she's like, hmm, okay, yeah, I guess that that's, a, no, 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 not I guess that's what it always was. Don't let that memory go. Don't let go of the memory because I finally got something that she remembered. Mandela Effect truthers and casuals alike want to know why something isn't and has never been like they remember, and will search for an explanation. In many cases, they come to find an answer to their false memory, whether it be a point of reference for misassociation or otherwise. Sometimes they find that their memory is grounded in reality. For example, one supposed example of the Mandela Effect proved to be false. Judge Judy never used a gavel. However, footage was eventually found of her using a gavel, though since the gavel use was rare, the association between Judge Judy and the gavel likely just stems from the fact that she's a judge and a signature tool a judge uses is a gavel. It's not rocket science. However, unlike the casuals, Mandela Effect truthers thrive on confirmation bias to reaffirm they aren't alone with their memories. Not that their memory is based in truth within this reality, but that their memory is actually based in another reality. They want the Mandela effect to be real because they hold onto faith in their memories. 
I produced a video entitled The Mandela Effect and the World Famous Jiffy Burger. At the time, I never planned on making a part two, but recent events made me aware of just how important this famous peanut butter burger really is. In my opinion, it's one of the strongest pieces of evidence of worlds crossing over and the existence of multiple realities. Yeah, hi, I see that you have a peanut butter uh, hamburger called a Jiffy Burger. Yes. I was wondering what kind of peanut butter you guys put on that. Uh, that one, what are we, I, um, I believe we actually use, uh, Extra Crunch, uh, Skippy. You use Skippy? I, I believe so, um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it started with, uh, Jiffy, but I think we just like that, that Extra Crunch a little better. Okay. All right. I was just curious. I was thinking of trying it out. Thank you. It, it's awesome. Yeah. Have a good one. All right. Thanks. Truthers will search all across the internet and media for examples from history that match their memories. Let's say, for example, they search for Jiffy peanut butter in a grocery store ads archive. Yes, indeed. They will find quite a few examples of ads misreporting the peanut butter as Jiffy instead of Jeff. Mandela Effect truthers call these examples reality residue or residual evidence, implying that reality has shifted, but little things remain. Well, some of them could be breadcrumbs. From what? Mistakes left behind by the countless tiny micro-corrections that Sim might have to make to keep it on course. Updates. And every month, more and more of these things are coming out. More and more proof, more and more evidence. Because yes, maybe it is possible that we all switched into a parallel universe and a bunch of little things changed. But I feel like if you switch constantly, like if people keep going back and forth between time, there's going to be little loopholes. There's going to be little things that didn't change or little things that got missed. And I feel like that's what's happening because I keep seeing more and more people find proof that it's real. Mandela Effect truthers love residual evidence, despite the fact that all it does is just confirm that throughout time, people had certain memories of a given thing incongruous to this reality. Which, for popular Mandela Effect examples, they already know. Residual evidence doesn't prove anything. Notably, all those ads containing the supposed reality residue of Jiffy peanut butter never have residual evidence of the Jiffy peanut butter product in photographic form, only text or off-brand illustrations. Side note, in case you're wondering, we may mistake Jeff for being Jiffy because of our mental association with Skippy peanut butter. Furthermore, it can also be associated with Jiffy lube or Jiffy cake mix. Actually, I used to remember it being Jiffy, but then I connected the dots and made sense of it. This all happened when I was a child, mind you. I used Jiffy peanut butter as an example, but the search results for residual evidence for a given Mandela affected product share similar patterns. Indeed, people may remember things wrongly, just like you, or be bad at spelling, just like you, many truthers are bad at spelling, because their minds make similar mental associations and connect the dots incorrectly in the same way. Some believe that the Mandela effect is the result of our brain reconsolidating memories. MRI research has shown that memories are stored in our brains nearby to similar memories. For example, if you learn that Alexander Hamilton was a founding father at the same time you learn that he was not president, but other founding fathers were, you are more likely to misremember that Alexander Hamilton was president because neurons fired when asked about Hamilton were also fired when asked about presidents. With that said, yes, reality residue can be interesting at times. For example, with Rodin's The Thinker, many people recall the statue posing with his hand or fist on his forehead, but he actually has his clenched hand beneath his chin. Many people believe that his hand originally rested directly against his forehead, but now that isn't the case. It instead rests against his chin. Others claim it has always been this way, so which side do you fall on? Is it the forehead or the chin? Modern day photographs of people posing in front of the thinker, doing the thinker pose incorrectly. It's literally in the frame with you. Just look over your shoulder. And it's not just one photo. It's over and over and over. This kind of stuff is what makes the Mandela effect creepy. It's the kind of stuff that makes it all time scary. Either everyone is dumb, no one can follow directions, 
or something weird is going on. This is a eureka moment for Mandela Effect truthers. Despite the fact you can find plenty of photos of people also replicating the same pose that he actually does make. This pose is likely brought on due to our mental association with the mind and the forehead being where we think, since the statue is the thinker. Taken, taken, um, taken, um, thinking. It's not, it's not happening with him. I do find it odd that in an IBM commercial, however, there is a replica of the thinker with the other reality pose, but they might have tweaked the design to drive a point home. If not, it still does not prove anything. Reality residue proves nothing, and it's not evidence for anything tangible either. But the thing is, with the Mandela effect, you cannot prove it or disprove it, because we are talking about reality convergence and so on. You can't simply tell a Mandela Effect truther, no, the thinker never posed with his hand on forehead, because they will likely agree that, indeed, in this reality, he didn't. But in their native reality, from which their affected memories were imported, the thinker did. Now, many people do not believe in these topics, but there's no definitive answer or evidence to prove it incorrect, just as there is no evidence to prove it correct. In other words, it's difficult to speak to Mandela Effect truthers because they refuse to accept that their memories are not founded in another reality and that they could be wrong. Yet they'll maintain, we don't know how to use our own eyes, that we all just confabulate these so-called anchor memories. Such feeble attempts from these gaslighters wanting us to doubt our own perceptions gets really old really fast. Don't ever hesitate to combat them and combat them strongly on it. There are some cases where a Mandela Effect truther will argue that sums of reality shifts back and forth. For example, they might believe the spelling of Fruit Loops keeps changing, from the correct F-R-O-O-T to F-R-U-I-T, and then back to O-O again. This is what the truthers refer to as flip-flops, which they cite as further evidence for the Mandela Effect indicating existence of reality shifting. In reality, ha, the truther is just mixing things up once again, either because they obsess over this stuff already and inevitably get confused, or their mind constantly creates false associations with similar things, in this case, other cereals like Fruity Pebbles in the cereal aisle. Side note, Fruit Loops was originally spelled with UI in 1959 before being re-released in 1963 with the OO spelling. It is spelled with the two O's to avoid falsely advertising the cereal as actually being fruit heavy when it's not. Fruit with two O's is actually trademarked as the designated flavor for those individual cereal loops. Once you know that, I guarantee it'll never flip flop back for you. And yes, all the colors are one flavor. Childhood ruined. Folks, I honestly can't believe the words that are about to come out of my mouth because I can hardly believe it myself, but my research is telling me that Fruit Loops are all the same flavor. You heard that right. All the colors taste identical. I mean, I swear as a kid I could taste a difference between each colored loop, but then again, I also swore that Bernstein Bears was spelled with an E-I. The Bernstein Bears. From what I can tell, flip-flops like the aforementioned example are a sad excuse for supposed evidence. If anything, it challenges their attempts of legitimizing reality shifts. But alas, they don't see it that way. The next Mandela effect that I want to talk about is yet another flip-flop Mandela effect. I feel like lately there have been so many of these where I swear I talked about it in the opposite way and then all of a sudden it switched. This one has to do with the JFK assassination. I always remember the car being a six-seater I swear that there was a Mandela effect that the car was actually a four-seater, but we remember it being a six-seater, and that was the whole Mandela effect. But recently, I was looking at it, and it's a six-seater again, and I swear to God that that was a Mandela effect. I swear people were trying to say that it was a four-seater, and we were all like, no, bitch, it was a six-seater, and then like we looked at the actual fact, and it was a four-seater, but now six seater which is how i remember it is that a flip-flop or am i just confused i feel like that is the question with all of these flip-flop mandela effects is 
flip flop or am I literally stupid? Either is possible. Beyond scouring the interwebs for residue, the truther's pursuit of validation leads them to esoteric places, often obsessing over secret symbology and iconography. You see, to them, there are so many reality shifts to logos, because the word logos can also mean the word of God, or something convoluted like that. Why change something trivial, like company logos, is a common question often asked by people newly introduced to the Mandela Effect. It's a good question, though. One I wanted an answer to myself, so a while back I had looked into the meaning of the word logos. There's of course the common definition for graphic design, but most intriguing for our purpose is the theological definition with the Greek word of the same spelling, logos. Meaning, the word of God, principle of divine reason and creative order, incarnate in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, and Son of Man is found hidden in plain sight in the name of Nelson Mandela. I don't know about you, but I have a feeling none of this is by chance. I have a feeling someone is trying to get through to us. The pseudo-theological pursuit of Mandela Effect truthers naturally leads to conspiratorial thinking about socio-political changes. Some truthers posit that secular culture is straying away from God, who communicates to us through revisions to reality. But the powers that be seek to control us through social and medical progress. They don't want a spiritually awakened population to contend with, awakened by the Son of Man. So dark forces are maneuvering to prevent such an awakening, by keeping us from God and our true divine nature, in an effort to maintain their hierarchy of control. Don't let them succeed, don't play along with their sick little mask fetish, and most of all, don't accept the potent toxins they'll be attempting to place inside us. There's a lot at stake beyond just our physical bodies. Other truthers see the Mandela Effect as an elaborate puzzle of sorts that God put before us to piece together. So one reality shift is connected to another, and only once the puzzle pieces are put together will we understand God's message to us. Did you know the Mandela Effect is actually a big puzzle? The changes have meaning. They fit together and reveal a message that is for all of us. For example, there is one truther who dedicates his YouTube channel to piecing together reality shifts in popular movies, and synthesizing common messages of those movies as a model for God's message to us, or whatever. It's as contrived as it sounds. We've got to talk a little more about this table and these movies. Whatever you think, and whatever you believe, and however you want to explain the Mandela Effect, that's all fine by me. But can you do this? Can you look at what I've just shown you, at what is now right in front of your face, and open your mind to the fact that this comes from the power behind the Mandela Effect to you? Right now, we see that a couple special movies, I call them message movies, are telling us that history is fake. With this added to our knowledge, will we be able to see why Chick-fil-A is a Mandela Effect? So basically, like-minded truthers jot down notes for these normie movies and their normie movie messages to reinforce the same theories religious Mandela Effect truthers already adopt. Alrighty then. Blind faith when it pertains to religion and patriotism can be dangerous, not only because it is something that countries exploit to gain support for atrocities on a domestic and international level, but also as something that, that can deeply hinder someone's mental health, judgment, critical thinking skills, and even spiritual growth. We were once a Christian nation. We are no longer a Christian nation. Soon we won't even be a, a majority Christian nation. And as our founders knew, this doesn't work. It, it's not working. The country doesn't work when it, when it is not anchored in the Christian faith. Many devout Christians with blind faith in the United States today are also politically conservative, in large part because their families and community are. Like-minded people stick with what is familiar to them. After all, that is their model for what a good Christian ought to look like. Even those actively conservative in politics tend to be passive critical thinkers, often excusing community-approved sins like murder, think capital punishment and warfare, and greed as they tend to support capitalism in spite of money being a root of different evils. As if the interests of the nation, so long as they are seemingly rooted in Christianity, 
or what they perceive to be Christian principles, are ostensibly good. For this reason, they will also be intolerant to new social developments, including civil rights movements, as they think they are straying away from the model for the country and family that they have faith in. Challenging the status quo interrupts their security and their faith in God and country. We went into an alternative timeline at some point right here. I don't know when it happened, but we, like everything, the pandemic, Trump being elected, the, the riots last year, like it's just like, Every, or two years ago, like everything is just so insane. It feels Society's like just getting crazy. It, it feels like circa 2013, there was some break point in reality. We just entered into the alternative timeline that really shouldn't exist. And, uh, and that, that's where we are right now. Conservatives in the United States want to preserve their idealized vision of the past and the present and future for they fear change. However, the conservative idealized vision is fundamentally removed from reality. What they are asking for is an Americana sold to them through 1950s Coca-Cola ads that allows for white middle-class America to thrive, while simultaneously ignoring the injustices towards women, people of color, the poor, the disabled, and the gay and trans, because they would rather uphold a vaguely Christian community and the aspirations for white patriarchy and capitalism that they too are impacted by to varying degrees. This mentality is seen among truthers as not only do they tend to have blind faith in the Mandela effect, but often also tend to uphold their perception of the status quo of yesteryear, in line with their idealized vision for the present modeled off of their warped perceptions of the past. Like conservative casuals, Mandela effect truthers do not see the past accurately. They too are blinded by their faith, patriotism, and nostalgia, recollecting a past in an idealistic and naive way and fearing change for the future. You know, we've seen these sort of, uh, you know, these, these, these riots in the Capitol buildings sort of launched by people who have allowed their brains to become like basically rotted by misinformation, by pseudoscience, by crackpot conspiracy theories. Like once you start going down the path of entertaining crap like the Mandela effect, you know, it can easily lead to stuff like QAnon if you're not careful, because it's all based on the premise of rejecting objective truth, of, of rejecting like objective evidence and, uh, you know, sort of empirical science and data and all of this other kind of stuff, Occam's razor logic and all the rest of it. It's about sacrificing all of that in favor of conspiratorial thinking. And that is dangerous. And that is why, like I said, like Mandela effect and, and sort of having conversations like this, it's not a purely innocent thing. It can be quite sinister. The truth is obsession with fringe theories like the Mandela effect is to reassure them that their view of the past will not be tainted or that their level of knowledge be tested. Unsurprisingly, many truthers, like conservative casuals, do not know much about history, even of their own country, let alone others. When they first hear about something like the underreported 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre for the first time, they won't think about how the United States education system sidelines all the ugly moments in history, where white people slaughtered black people. Instead, they assume, what? That doesn't make sense. This didn't happen in my reality. I would have heard about this for sure. Uh, I will tell you, I read a, I read a New York Times piece on a hundred year old survivor of the Tulsa massacre. And my question was this, what's the Tulsa massacre? Another big one is there are a lot of supposed shifts surrounding the Statue of Liberty and on what island it resides, but also a lot of people misremember going to the top of the torch before it was closed down following the 9-11 terror attacks except public access to the torch was closed down in 1916, after it suffered damage from the Black Tom explosion. Of course, since they didn't know about the Black Tom explosion, they insist it didn't happen in their native reality. Crazy stuff. The Black Tom explosion is my favorite Mandela effect because of the sheer absurdity of it all. No one remembers the first terrorist attack in American history. No one remembers that it created the Espionage Act. No one remembers that it was the reason the United States of America jumped into World War I. It's apparently even the reason you can't climb into the torch of the Statue of Liberty. The effects of it are felt everywhere, but somehow no one remembers ever hearing about this until a few years ago. In fact, many supposed reality shifts follow the pattern of the truth or simply not knowing something is real and then getting surprised by its existence. For example, some truthers out there are absolutely shocked by the news that narwhals are real animals because they assume that like unicorns, narwhals are fantastical. But here's what's weird. I've discussed this with my girlfriend in the past, but when I asked her yesterday if they were real or maple leaf, she said maple leaf. She only knew it from Elf and some other movie. 
And then when I showed it to her, she was in disbelief and then asked me, where do they live? And I was shocked. She's never asked me a question about any changes that I've pointed out, ever. And I thought this might have been the recall that snapped her out of her numb skull denial self-defense mechanism. All it did was set off a booby trap in her mind. And that self-defense mechanism kicked in and showed the other side of it, which is annoyance. She's either numb to it or annoyed by it. I'm sorry, but this is just ridiculous. You can't just respond to learning something new with refusal to believe. It's not mind-blowing. Most people just live their lives without thinking about narwhals. And unless you're like from the Arctic waters or something, you don't see them because they get so anxious and die in captivity. Never saw a narwhal in her life and she was the unicorn master. So, Mandela effect? Could be. Very well could be. That's not a Mandela effect. You just weren't aware that narwhals were a real thing until now. That's on you. Take some responsibility. It becomes especially mind-numbing when truthers start insisting that they know history, geography, and science better than experts because their attachment to their memory is so strong. You know, I'm something of a scientist myself. As a result, you'll see them getting worked up about details of the world map as well as what is in the sky and when. For example, a number of them insist the moon and the sun cannot be observed in the sky at the same time, which just tells me that they haven't seen the sky enough. There's the moon. There's the sun. Ow. Hey, fun fact. Just because people commonly associate the sun with day and the moon with night does not mean that they cannot be observed simultaneously depending on when and where. Truly mind-blowing stuff right there. What I don't get is the fact that this is new to me and I've been looking up at chemtrails for over a decade, shaking my head at them, wondering why people can't see what's going on. I was a sun gazer for a few years. I'm not some guy with my head stuck in my phone that never looks up. So I feel like I'm back in 2016, waking up to the Mandela effect again. And people are just ridiculing me and stuff. Memory is untrustworthy. Think about how often you forget where you parked or where you put your phone. You might even look for it while holding onto it. Consider the things we use all the time, like money, for example. Many people in the United States can't even recall who is on what coin and dollar, or even the design patterns of the coins and dollar. There is a chance you don't even know precisely how many moles are on your body or what's behind you right now. Sometimes we have to write down short security codes because our brain just simply forgets about it. And to be frank, that's fine. It doesn't matter. That's why the brain makes mistakes and recalls information inaccurately at times, especially when there's other similar things that we can connect that information to. Consider how easily influenced your brain is when you're tired. When we fall asleep, we dream. How often we do not even realize we are dreaming. When we drink and get high, we may lose control and wander off to other places. Mental disorders and psychological conditions can lead to poor memory or a lack of proper grasp on reality. The reality. All this should be common sense, but the problem is truthers lack common sense because they are too far gone down that rabbit hole for what is likely a variety of factors, including upbringing that makes it easier to fall into these trappings. Someone might notice something seems different, something seems wrong but it is their responsibility as an adult and a critical thinker to reason with being wrong. That regardless of what they remember and their friends remember, they are indeed wrong. Mandela Effect truthers fail to critically consider reason and logic and operate purely on their emotions and desires. They would rather point their fingers at others and say that they are wrong and back that up with nothing but fallacious excuses for evidence. Learn to pay better attention to detail deniers is probably why you're not noticing these effects. I say all this while still maintaining a belief that not everything in this universe can be explained with reason. That is to say, our concept of reason is limited by not only our biases, but the fact we are only still taking baby steps towards our potential. 
And still, even I do not have faith in human potential. Existence does not make sense, and it never will. But we can do our best to make sense of it, and fringe theories like the Mandela Effect do not help. But wait, what if the Mandela Effect truthers are right? I asked my kids this morning, hey, imitate a gorilla pounding his chest. <laughs> like this, right? No. No. <laughs> nope. Guess what? It's not exactly uncommon for people to experience the Mandela effect. I know because I too have been Mandela affected. And I'll tell you why. I mentioned the Jiffy anecdote already, but as a kid, I also vividly remember Kit Kat having a hyphen in its name. In fact, when I was a wee little lad, lassie, lad, I remember learning about hyphens and how to use them, and I recall Spider-Man and Kit Kat being my go-to examples. My mnemonic process to remember this was to think of the Kit Kat bars themselves as the hyphens. And so when I realized that actually Kit Kat doesn't and hasn't had a hyphen, I just shrugged it off and thought it was weird. Think about it. Of all the candies out there, you have a mass wave of those who insist it was Kit Kat that once had a dash. And the very thing it's named after always has a dash. The obvious knockoff brand has a dash, but the actual candy bar we're all familiar with now never did. Kit Kat Club and Take It are obscure items. It's not like we're getting carried away insisting it was once Baby Dash Ruth, Milky Dash Way, or Butter Dash Finger. It's always and only to do with the shared consistent claim when it comes to candy that it was Kit Kat that used to have a dash. Not what you'd expect from a diverse group of unrelated individuals suffering from confabulations. I also had a similar experience when I learned that it was actually the Bernstein Bears, not Bernstein Bears. And this was before the Mandela Effect was coined as a concept. I could have swore it was the suffix Steen, or Stein, depending on how you pronounce it, and thought it was weird that it wasn't. And this is because I remembered it being Stein. I must have had it confused with other Stein names. I know I knew of Frankenstein and Einstein, at least. I was even a kid then. Again, I just shrugged it off because it doesn't matter to me. You remember the, the children's book when you were growing up about the family of bears? The Berenstein Bears. Berenstein, S-T-E-I-N. Yeah, Stein, they were Jewish. But there are two Mandela effects that really get to me, and one of them was the side view mirrors on cars. I remember so clearly that when I would sit in the passenger seat, the mirror in front of me would read as, Objects in mirror may be closer than they appear. Objects in mirror may be closer than they appear. To me, this phrase was memorable precisely because it was weird that it read as maybe, as if there was some level of deniability. That in fact, they may be closer, but aren't necessarily closer. People have had entire discussions while in commute, wondering why incorrectly stated may be closer, when the objects are indeed for sure closer. Anchor conversations that should never have happened because according to federal law, it's always been the definitive are closer phrasing. The times I would sit up front, usually when my rule breaking dad was driving or when the cars were parked, I often took a look out of the passenger seat and lo and behold, the passenger side view mirror said the same thing. Objects and mirror may be closer than they appear. Or that's what I've remembered it saying anyway. But then, shockingly, the next thing I knew, I saw the ominous R popping up in different side of view mirrors in reality. I thought it might be an either or kind of thing, that newer models of cars produced a new mirror with new inscription. So Keller me surprised when I was informed that side view mirrors never said maybe. This is a common example of the Mandela effect for many, many people. They swear on their life that side of view mirrors used to read one way. And there is reality residue galore for this one. Item after item, preserving an alternate past, word for word matching what used to be observed, or springboarding off the maybe phrasing to deliver a punchline. 
ad after ad, headline after headline, image after image, joke after joke, meme after meme, referencing or parroting the conspicuous inscription in a way that it supposedly never was. Objects in mirror may be closer than they appear. There was also the more long-winded, objects in the rearview mirror may appear closer than they are. Which actually means the exact opposite if you think about it for two seconds. Perhaps for a dramatic purpose, this memory is preserved in, or manifest from, Meatloaf's song. A good song at that. And objects in the rearview mirror may appear closer than they are. But alas, I have come to the conclusion that I, like many others, am probably just wrong. The best, although not exactly satisfying, explanation for this phenomenon is that we associate the mere inscription with legal warnings. May cause drowsiness, may result in death, and so on and so forth. And if you think about it, if we're, if we're, if we're having like early memories of this inscription on the mirror, at the same time, we may also look at um, airbag warnings. Um, it could be something along those lines. Truthers might deny these claims and insist that because they are adults, they can't be wrong, and therefore a much less logical answer seems more logical to them. Not the best argument there. Though I must admit, I find myself having a difficult time humbling myself to accept that I am wrong about this because my memory is just too strong. Or at least, I would like to think it is strong. Analyzing my relationship to the mere inscription alone leads me to confront just how confused I can get about the whole ordeal because of all the contrasting information in my head. Objects may be sexier than they appear. However, there is one Mandela effect that I find especially difficult to debunk in my head, but perhaps that is due to my own stubbornness. With the Fruit of the Loom logo, people are supposedly mistaken in envisioning a distinct brown object unlike anything else in the frame. An instantly recognizable iconic design element that's now been entirely erased from existence. We need only go to the company website to confirm, not once has the curvaceous horn of plenty ever been implemented into the design of their logo. So you go here, Fruit of the Loom, history, 150 years, and never had a cornucopia. Never had cornucopia in this reality. I, re I have conscious memories of a reality where it looked more like this. I like many, many, many... Many others remember the fruit within the Fruit of the Loom being housed in a cornucopia, or horn of plenty. And many other people recall this too, and just assume that the company eventually opted for a more simplistic logo, and ditched the horn altogether. But, in fact, aside from an April Fool's joke in 2022, there is no record of the logo ever possessing a cornucopia. People may chalk it up to misassociations with autumn decor, often seen in cornucopias, often with pumpkins and squashes, and there may be some truth to this, but the actual color scheme here is quite different and in many parts of the world, something as uncommon and weirdly specific as a cornucopia is distant from people's everyday thoughts. People aren't mentally inserting the cornucopia into other logos with fruits. So the question is, why would they use this brand's logo? For most of us, the sight of a cornucopia will evoke a color palette of gold, brown, and orange, consistent with the changing vegetation of autumn. These colors are mostly absent from the Fruit of the Loom logo, so it's somewhat far-fetched to infer that this image would naturally prime people to think of a cornucopia. If that were the case, then wouldn't people be mistaking a cornucopia out of any logo with a pile of fruit? Why aren't we misassociating cornucopias to other brands if that's really what we're so compelled to see? Plenty of other stuff out there with fruit clustered visuals that are ripe for mass collective misremembering. Of course, there is plenty of supposed residual evidence supporting people's memories, such as newspaper articles and parodies. An episode of South Park features Cornucopia brand underwear, and the Ant Bully features Fruit of the Loin underwear with a Cornucopia in its logo. Frank West's 1973 jazz album, Flute of the Loom parodies the brand with its title and album cover, which features food and leaves arranged similar to the clothing brand's logo. The only difference is they are spilling out of a flute almost to parody the original logo, despite the parody not even making sense. When Ellis Chapel, the artist of the album cover, was asked about it, he insisted the cornucopia must have been in the original logo. Do you know for certain that there was a cornucopia? There had to be. I would have no reason to paint the image that way if there had not been a cornucopia. The flute takes the place of the cornucopia, but it would not make any sense at all if there had not been a cornucopia to begin with. 
it's a take off the label so it has a resembled the label substantially otherwise it would make no sense i've actually had deniers say that because of the color coordination amongst the fruits and foods that that makes it enough to be an obvious parody <laughs> a correlation they're only able to notice by the way because they're sitting down studiously taking time to analyze both right next to each other the fruit of the looms logo is what ultimately led me down the mandela effect rabbit hole which soon fascinated me less for the logical nature of the theory and more for the fringe personalities backing it. Cornu means horn in Latin. Copia means abundance in Latin. Therefore, a cornucopia is a horn of plenty. The meaning of horn is that our higher being is the horn of this world. He is the real king and he is in control. The ram which thou sawest having two horns, are the kings of Medea and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. I've engaged in the comment sections of a select few of these videos, so maybe I should apologize for being passively misleading. Even the Fruit of the Loom logo, the most convincing suggestion of reality shifts, has an explanation, regardless of how hard it is for me or anyone else to swallow. Uh, real quick though, the uh, the leaf theory, yeah, that one sucks. Even when painted brown, nobody in the right mind will mistake the leaves themselves for the cornucopia. The fruit being arranged with leaves in such a way that invokes mental associations with autumn decor is probably just one piece of the puzzle. It's a specific arrangement with the leaves. It looks too familiar, especially for those in the United States, who might see a cornucopia here and there seasonally. We should think specifically about what's unique to the logo that makes us mentally picture a cornucopia where we wouldn't put it otherwise. I think it's not so much the picture and more so the text, the name, fruit of the loom. I hypothesize that it is because we see the fruit, we want to also see the loom, which the fruit belongs to, fruit of the loom. However, like cornucopias, we don't think too much about looms, so our mind races to place the fruit in something, but what it comes up with is not a loom, but a cornucopia, due to slightly similar images we might see otherwise. Maybe the flute cornucopia was simply a design choice to distinguish the album from the actual brand logo. After all, a flute ought to be depicted, right? The artist might simply just be forgetting. That was 1973, after all. If you're still unconvinced, I'm not sure what to tell you. Even I have a hard time rectifying that there is no cornucopia, because I swear that there is. But alas, I must confront reality. My memory is fallible, a truther's even more so. I'm not here to lie, human memory is unreliable, but these entries do push hard to persuade me to think that maybe there is a reality where cornucopias existed on the tags of the Fruit of the Loom undergarments. The Avengers are on the show tonight. <laughs> so in a game of telephone, we whisper something in one person's ear and they whisper it in the next and so on and so forth. By the time you get to the end of the line, the actual message might be completely distorted. The diaphragm jelly is in my glove box? <laughs> <laughs> Memory itself is like a telephone game. That's what Marla Paul said in an article published for Northwestern Now. When we recall a memory, we are actually recalling our memory of a memory, and so on and so forth. And so memory itself is highly susceptible to distortion. A memory is not simply an image produced by time traveling back to the original event. It can be an image that is somewhat distorted because of the prior times you remembered it. Memories aren't static. If you remember something in the context of a new environment in time, or if you are even in a uh, different mood, your memories might integrate the new information. Retrieving the memory didn't simply reinforce the original association. Rather, it altered memory storage to reinforce the location that was recalled at session two. Memories normally change over time, sometimes becoming distorted. When you think back to an event that happened to you long ago, say your first day at school, you actually may be recalling information you retrieved about that event at some later time, not the original event. 
In all likelihood, this is ultimately what is occurring with the Mandela effect. A truther might even find themselves agreeing in the infallibility of memory, but they will still assert their dominance over the telephone game memetics of recalling information. But sorry, guys, your path to enlightenment is only straying you further and further away from logic and common sense. Sometimes it's easier to imagine that reality itself has been distorted than confront the idea that our memory on an everyday level is quite fallible. We go about our lives under the assumption that what we remember is entirely accurate, and it's terrifying to consider that our assessment of reality may only be tenuous at best. In an article published for Monitor Staff, author Bridget Murray cites psychologist Dr. Daniel Shakespeare's session at the 2003 APA convention in honor of his book, The Seven Sins of Memory, How the Mind Forgets and Remembers. Shakespeare evaluates memory and argues that its failure can be attributed to seven major things. Let's go through them and see how they might apply to the Mandela effect, shall we? Okay, Jane, get ready for this masterpiece. It'll be the greatest thing you've ever heard. Transience. The decreasing accessibility of memory over time. While a degree of this is normal with ageing, decay of or damage to the hippocampus and temporal lobe can cause extreme forms of it. Yes, most definitely. Some of the older Gen X and Y Mandela Effect truthers like to shame Gen Z skeptics for not knowing how things used to be when in reality, they're just old. And let's be frank, old people can forget things from time to time and remember things poorly. With that said, I don't think a lot of Mandela Effect truthers simply have brain damage or something, just that there is some truth to memory being a little rusty as time goes on. Absent-mindedness. Lapses of attention and forgetting to do things. This sin operates both when a memory is formed, the encoding stage, and when a memory is accessed, the retrieval stage. So this is like when you find yourself losing your glasses or a phone. You weren't paying much attention and you have trouble remembering where you put it. In fact, when I wrote this part of the video, I had no idea where my earbuds were. Could absent-mindedness lead to the Mandela effect? Why yes, because when you are absent-minded, you tend to forget details as they are presented to you, and so details suddenly surprise you when you remember them differently. Blocking. Temporary inaccessibility of stored information, such as tip-of-the-tongue syndrome. Blocking is when we know something, but we can't recall precisely what it was until we were presented with the information. So it's like, ah, uh, who is that actor? What's his face? And then they're told, and you're like, yes, Lucas Hedges, that's who I was talking about. I don't think this one is particularly relevant to the Mandela effect, though, because in this case, people are attempting to recall information, but aren't sure what it is precisely. The Mandela affected generally have at least a vague understanding of the memories they hold. They just are wrong about the accuracy that these memories support reality ordinarily. I figured I should mention it anyway. Suggestibility. Incorporation of misinformation into memory due to leading questions, deception, and other causes. We construct memories according to our surroundings, and if our surroundings constantly tell us one thing, even if it does not reflect reality according to our measurements, the individual might start believing it anyway. Are Mandela Effect truthers guilty of suggestibility? Yes, all the time. Oh, but a Mandela Effect truther might counter-argue, excuse me, ma'am, wouldn't I, the enlightened one, actually be the opposite of being prone to suggestibility? given the fact that I am not falling for the same reality agenda that you are? To which I reply, no, son, because my worldview is not shaped by allegiance to my memory. Memory errors can also be created by suggesting something about the person's memory. One example of suggestibility involves the presuppositions to suggest facts. For example, you could ask someone who is rather suggestible, what time in the afternoon did you see the man walking down the street? Now this question itself is very highly suggestive. First of all, it suggests that the person did see a man walking down the street. Secondly, it does suggest that the person saw a man. And thirdly, it also suggests that the time in which they saw the man was in the afternoon, as opposed to in the morning or the evening. And if none of these facts were established earlier, that simple question could be a case of leading a witness. Can you picture the Monopoly man? Yeah. What's on his face? 
What does this have to do with anything? What does, what does he wear on his face? Um, one of those, um, monocle. Yeah. So apparently, it's never been the case. I mean, I'm pretty sure he does. Someone says, um, you know, he always, the Monopoly man always had a monocle. And you're like, yep, that is now the way that I remember him. Because you didn't really have much of a memory about him before. So there's just this notion that it just happens that people say, oh yeah. You know, and they kind of go along with it. Uh, that's a much easier to buy explanation than alternate realities. Mandela effect truthers are very prone to suggestibility, in part because they often are gullible as well. There was this one obvious troll who posted an obvious hoax of his copy of the Bible and Bernstein Bears, changing to the alternate reality version and back, depending on what room he was in in his house. Of course, Mandela effect truthers fell for it. Really? I mean, look at that. That shit is changing right there. Anyway. Bias. Retrospective distortions produced by current knowledge and beliefs. Yup, that tracks. Persistence. Unwanted recollections that people can't forget, such as the unrelenting intrusive memories of post-traumatic stress disorder. This one is a bit sad, but probably true when it comes to Mandela Effect truthers. When a memory is so intrusive, so unrelenting, that even if you would like to believe something is supported by reality, it is either near impossible or difficult to do so. Although when Shakespeare talks about persistence, he is more so talking about trauma rather than double stuffed Oreo cookies and cheese at crackers. Misattribution. Attribution of memories to incorrect sources or believing that you have seen or heard something you haven't. Bingo. Misattributing one thing for another is pretty common among Mandela Effect examples. I think that much has been made clear already. It's very curious that in spite of Mandela Effect truthers' constant insistence that their memories are indeed not wrong, that they tend to still practice the majority of common sins of memory. So without any real evidence to support their theory and all evidence against them, it is hard for me to take the Mandela Effect reality shifts seriously. There we go, I hope that helps, whatever weird video this is meant to be. However, we should also consider the fact that reality itself is not real. That is, at least according to some philosophical thinkers. I feel if I were to tackle Soren Kierkegaard or Friedrich Nietzsche and so on, we would be straying a bit too far from the Mandela effect in what I have to say about it, but I should note that how we think of reality is ultimately based on how we choose to measure it, what aspects we choose to hone in on, what criteria we set forth, and so when we take something as objective, such as, say, mathematics, it is ultimately based on subjectively and arbitrarily designated axioms that could, in theory, potentially be traded with other arbitrary axioms and measured and understood differently. And so, like it or not, we are ultimately reducing everything to something. Personally, I would just call everything reality and assume reality is bound to some level of objectivity. But every attempt of people to measure it is ultimately exercising subjective biases and standards. And even when seemingly shared on a collective level, they too are individualized. Does this mean that the Mandela Effect truthers could be right? Um, not really. I mean, at least they're not right in the ways that they think they are. At least it's certainly unlikely. This is because truthers lack coherent frameworks grounded in anything tangible and testable. In a recent study, Deparsi Prasad and Wilma Brainbridge conducted research on the visual Mandela effect, which they concluded to be a real phenomenon. In memory, that is. Of course, that's the only way this phenomenon might even have plausibility in the author's minds. So to some, it may be misleading to say the Mandela effect exists because of its connotations. The Mandela effect exists. Shifts in reality? Less likely. In their article for The Conversation, Prasad and Brainbridge say the following. To see whether the visual Mandela effect really exists, we ran an experiment in which we presented people with three versions of the same icon. One was correct and two were manipulated, and we asked them to select the correct one. 
There were 40 sets of icons, and they included C-3PO from the Star Wars franchise, the Fruit of the Loom logo, and the Monopoly Man from the board game. In the results, which have been accepted for publication in the Journal of Psychological Sciences, we found that people fared very poorly on seven of them, only choosing the correct one around or less than 33% of the time. For these seven images, people consistently identified the same incorrect version, not just randomly choosing one of the two incorrect versions. In addition, participants reported being very confident in their choices and having high familiarity with these icons despite being wrong. We found that this false memory effect was incredibly strong across multiple different ways of testing memory. Even when the person saw the correct version of the icon, they still chose the incorrect version just a few minutes later. And when asked to freely draw the icons from their memory, people also included the same incorrect features. It may be that there is no one universal cause. Different images may elicit the visual Mandela effect for different reasons. Some could be related to prior expectations for an image, some might be related to prior visual experience with an image, and others could have to do with something entirely different than the images themselves. But the fact that we can demonstrate consistencies in false memories for certain icons suggests that part of what drives false memories is dependent on our environment and independent of our subjective experiences with the world. I read the actual study from those two towards the end of my research for this video. Unsurprisingly, it confirmed a fair amount of my arguments towards the Mandela effect. There seems to be something strange going on, and it's shared with one another. There's a part of me that sympathizes with the Mandela effect truther, because after all, he too is affected by his own socio-psychological disposition. Yes, it's hard for me to accept that there was never a weird horn thingy on my underwear, and that car mirrors are more effectively engraved. However, at the end of the day, we must accept it. The question is why I wanted to make this video. Well, that's because one day when I was sick in bed, I went down this weird rabbit hole on YouTube, and I just couldn't stop watching. And now I'm channeling all that I learned in this video. What do I want my viewers to gain from this? Insight. Not only to this phenomenon, but the rather fascinating personalities of those Mandela Effect truthers. <laughs> what do I want them to gain from this? I don't know. I agree with everything I said with absolutely no pushback, because by and large, I am right and you are wrong. Bye! We have our memories. They're real. No one can take that from us. <sighs> yeah. The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to preach the cousins that divides us has come. The time to build is upon us. That does not mean to say that uh, the enemies of Israel are our enemies. We refuse to take that position. You can call it being political or uh, a moral question, but uh, for anybody who changes his principles depending on whom he is dealing, that is not a man who can lead a nation.
I expect you to be consistent. I don't know if I have paralyzed you. No, 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 no. I... Hey, baby, check out the gun show going on over here. Boom! Bang! Firepower!